ugly question is drum roll please i know <laughs> how do you prepare for market changes and how far out do you forecast man that's you know well i like your first answer my first you don't <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, so i mean you know Again, you know, I touched on this in our in our previous episode. Using past data to predict future occurrences, uh, while is helpful, is also skewed because if you could use past data and the same things were happening again, you would predict the occurrences and correct them before they happen. That's right. However, that doesn't happen because different occurrences occur, and you can't foresee them because the same things keep happening, but different drivers are are forcing them. So how that, do you, how do you prepare right. for that? That's right. And I mean, COVID, I think, is a great example of random mm -hmm. things that occur. And randomly, we happen to have been at uh, a mastermind event, Freedom mm -hmm. Founders, um, the mastermind event. And they just did it for the trusted advisors. And mm -hmm. one of the exercises that they gave us was... You wake up in the morning, the newspaper's at your door, your company has just lost 50% of its business. What are you going to do? Yeah. How do you handle it? How do you prepare for that? Mm -hmm. It was out of the blue. I even remember when they told us to do that. I thought, that'll never happen. <laughs> and then two months later, yeah. COVID hits, right? Yeah. So it was, it's a good exercise to do. Um, to, to how, you know, how do you prepare? Well, you put yourself in the best possible scenarios that you can with the information that you have in front of you. Right. Um, you know, if, you know, if you're putting yourself in historically higher risk um, assets that at this particular time are yielding high yield. Well, you know, to me, when I look at that, I say, okay, well, that's a historically, you know, volatile asset. Um, and you're in it and if something volatile happens, you could take a big loss. Huge. Um, so, you know, just, just managing where you're at um, on your portfolio. Uh, you, you know, you want to be in things. We, we talked about this before. Talk about the risk. Yeah. That you, you The about. risk. You're like you want to be like, you want to be in things that, you know, with fair certainty, you can never know everything, but with fair certainty, what your loss level would be. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you have to know where is my cutoff point? Mm. If I, if you know my loss, you know, I, I don't predict that I'll ever lose more than 10% on this asset, but if it gets to 12, that's where I cut ties and, cut and, 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 and just run from. And I just say here, you know, it, it's gone. It's, you know, so you have to know those points because controlling your losses helps you control your profit. That's right. That's right. And, I always am shocked at the people who try to hit a home run every time they get up to the plate mm -hmm. because it's, this isn't a home run game. You were talking about numbers. Mm -hmm. They don't lie. They tell good stories. They do. <laughs> they tell good stories. I can, you can get, you know, um, nothing special. Anyone can make a number, a statistic, say whatever they want it to say. That's right. Um, That's why we have the federal government. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if I hurt your feelings. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, but the, the data is important. What's more important than the data is to not get lost in it and all, and solely use it to make the decisions current and future. That's right. Because that data was created based on occurrences and factors that are no longer or maybe less likely or maybe more likely to occur now the, you know, the factors have changed. So you can't use that. Like, it's like people trying to like, you know, predict the, the stock market or like, Hey, you know, this thing always does this. It's like, yeah, but what if this happens? Oh, that's never happened. Neither did 2008. <laughs> yeah. Never happened. did 2008. Never did, you know, like, you know, COVID and, you know, like, I mean, I know we can go back to Spanish influenza, but you know, that's, <laughs> that's pretty deep. Yeah. <laughs> But, but yeah, you, you, you know, use data, but don't get lost in it. Um, I think that's one of the things like we were talking about someone who was a, you know, mathematician or, you know, that's one of the fallacies of that type of mindset is you look at the numbers and you're like, these are the numbers. These are what it is. And you have to couple that 
with looking around you <laughs> and knowing what's happening right now. That's right. And, you know, honestly, a little bit of luck and a little bit of intuition. That's, that's right. That's exactly yeah. right. That, that's exactly right. You know, uh, I said earlier on the, on the other uh, show that we did, I've talked about this Facebook post that I thought was really interesting because we're talking about changing markets and um, they're always changing. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what this business is. Real estate is a changing market constantly, constantly. And we want to make sure that we're able to change with it. That's yeah. why we're problem solvers. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. So I have a friend uh, in Collective Genius that posted this question and I loved it. He said, we've seen a significant slowdown in the market with some areas having active prices less than the sold prices. Mm -hmm. Things that would get multiple offers are now sitting for weeks. Anyone else seeing that? Now this guy is from California. Um, mm -hmm. But I really wanted to to share some of the answers because people in this collective genius are located all over the place. So the first guy says, we've seen a slowdown in Chattanooga, but Knoxville seems to be going strong. Mm -hmm. Same state. Yep. Not even that far from each other. These cities are not that far from each other. Chattanooga is more of a resort town. Knoxville is not. Knoxville is a college town. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so Knoxville is still going strong. Chattanooga is slowing down a little. I've always said, and it's from data that I get this. I'm not just making it up. Resort areas drop first. Yeah. Absolutely. They go up for, they go up last actually, but they drop first. Yeah. And they go up quick, quick, like, like uh, it's a more of a straight up. Yeah. Um, so you got to be careful in those areas. Uh, the other one said, another answer says, uh, we're noticing it slightly in Springfield, Missouri. Still very strong, though. Appraisals are starting to get squirrely. A hundred percent, as another guy says, still a hot market, but definitely signs of cooling down. Um, I like this one, too. It says, depending on the property type and location, yep. single family in most areas still going strong, but not getting flooded with offers and showings like they were before. Mm -hmm. I like that I can see how many showings agents are getting through showing time. That's what we real estate agent use. They act like they've had a lot of activity, but there aren't any showing scheduled. So that what they're saying is that they can actually see what's going on. Yeah. And, other, and some of the agents don't realize that. Major softening here in Chicago. Showings and offers are drastically dropped. Um, even some rehabbed properties are not selling and we're having to reduce the list price. Um uh, let me see who else is there. Market appears to have peaked for us in Arizona in March. That's when they peaked. Yeah. Since then, it's flattened considerably, but buyer fatigue is set in. Now, Arizona always tends to be one of the front runners of what's going on. Yeah. Like when 2008 hit, Arizona, That's California, true. they were, they were in Florida. They were the places that kind of tanked first. Mm -hmm. Um, and when they have a comeback, they're the places that come back first. So, yeah. um, Your sand states. Yeah. Know. So yeah. it's something to really keep in mind. Late May seems to be the peak for DC um, from somebody else. Uh, here's, I like this. It says, it's interesting to hear because I'm hearing about some operators doing apartment syndications in Phoenix, claiming that the market is in high demand for their properties that they are raising capital for. I wonder if their numbers won't be as impressive over the coming years. And, and then I like this analogy too. Uh, we're going to use this analogy, the weather being 110 of a, rather than 120 degrees. Yeah. So it's still good. Yeah. It's still good, but it's not like it was. Yeah. I um, mean, everything's, you know, you know, relative. I mean, it's, Oh, it hit its peak in, in March. And now it's, you know, it seems to be cooling off. Well, uh, it was at a hundred and you know, like you said, 120 degrees in March, but now it's 110 when, you know, on average it's 90 degrees. Yeah. And you know, it's like, okay, it's still an up market. Yeah. yeah. Even with all of the things across the nation, we are still short on housing and affordable housing. I mean, we, we've talked about this time and time again, it's, and, and, you know, the supply chain issues, the cost issues have really hammered that. Right. I mean, and, and then one other thing is, I mean, I, I harp on this all the time. People are probably tired of me saying this. You, know, you have these um, capital institutions, hedge funds. I mean, the easiest one to recognize gets the most recognition is BlackRock. I mean, they are coming in and they are buying all of these homes. I mean, they are pricing out 
everyone else yeah. because they can, because yeah. their, their cost of capital is way lower. I mean, they can, they can have capital at next to 0% where, you know, if you and I go out there, we're paying, you know, you know, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12, right. whatever, 15%, right, whatever right. it may be. Um, so our cost of capital is much higher. So we're, we're all getting priced out yeah. and they're doing it because they have the data in front of them that says, you know, millennials aren't going to be homeowners. And then I always think like, is it chicken or the egg? <laughs> like, yeah. Are they not going to be homeowners because they don't want to be. And so they're buying up the properties to rent it out to them or they're not going to be homeowners because all the properties are being bought out. That's right. I also heard that millennials are the biggest buyers right now too. See, and that's not true. Huh? So the biggest buying pool right I now, I wonder if it's where you're located. I don't know. The biggest buying pool right now are 65 and older. Hmm. That is the largest buying pool there is. Um, millennials buying pool, but are they buying the most? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They're okay. buying the most. Um, and millennials, like everyone's catering a lot of stuff to millennials, but they're not buying. Well, there's a, they like the experience. Well, yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, the experience could be it, but it could also be, you know, housing has increased in price. Rates are slowly rising mm -hmm. and they're straddled. Most millennials are straddled with more debt than the previous generations. Loans. So their DTI doesn't work yeah. for conventional loans. Yeah. That's a I mean, very good point. Like, yeah. I mean, what's your average millennial have in, in college loans? I don't know, probably 20, 30,000 at least. Yeah. Um, with the, the prior generations didn't have that. Yeah. And you think about what they've been through from what they've seen real estate do mm -hmm. when they can, you know, really remember what they're saying they, they saw their parents go through 2008. Yep and and really lose a lot mm -hmm. um, and now they're kind of going through something similar yeah with the way the home prices are right now just un understanding that real estate to them seems really volatile it, yeah it definitely could i mean a uh, psychological uh, that'd be an interesting study I, I don't know if they've done that but that'd be an interesting one no it's the psychological effect on, on home buying of millennials. That's right. Yeah. That'd be and interesting. To, to wear a mask or not. Wear to wear a mask. a mask or not to wear a mask. <laughs> that would be the good study. Yeah. I, yeah. It's, it's, uh, you know, trying to figure out how you're going to, how you're going to adjust what you're doing for the market mm. is, you know, what do you do? I think everybody's going to have a little different way that they approach it, but I've, you know, we've been saying this over and over again, and that the affordable housing is really almost recession resistant. It's it definitely more so than than higher houses, uh, higher priced houses for sure. Uh, luxury homes. I mean, yeah. It's like, what do you you know, what do you do to to forecast out what what you need to do in this market? And, and kind of what I think is, and this is my personal opinion. These. I hear people all the time telling me, hey, you need to sell sell your rentals, cash out of them, and you know, really build up that capital stack. And I'm like, okay, then what? Like, so I have to think that the analysts for BlackRock and for all these other hedge funds are smarter than I am. So <laughs> I know that kills you to think that though. Man, <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, that's, you, know, you always want to be in the room where you're not the smartest. Uh, so they, they see the data. They know that holding this, these rentals are a good thing. Mm. So I would argue, keep all your rentals. Keep all of them. Like, how can it hurt? I mean, how can it hurt? Okay. So you, you have your rental. You, ca you do a cash out refinance. You keep it 75% or lower LTV. You get a little bit of cash. Yeah, it's going to be less than you did if you sold it. But now that cash is tax-free. 